Now, if you thought traditional warfare was scary, then be afraid, be very, very afraid of cyber war. That is, at least according to the rhetoric that many here in Washington, including President Obama, like to throw in out. Take a look. But our defense and military networks are under constant attack. Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups have spoken of their desire to unleash a cyber attack on our country. Attacks that are harder to detect and harder to defend against. Indeed, in today's world, acts of terror could come not only from a few extremists in suicide vests, but from a few keystrokes on the computer, a weapon of mass disruption. Well, weapons of mass destruction may now be the official U.S. response to a cyber attack. According to the Wall Street Journal, the Pentagon has a new plan to respond against cyber attacks with potential military action. I'm talking about bombs for hacks, so to speak. So does this policy actually make sense? And is it even realistic given how difficult it is to trace the source of an attack? Now, formal Pentagon policy or just saber rattling? Help, here to help me answer this question is Benjamin Friedman. He's a research fellow at the Cato Institute. Benjamin, thank you so much for being here. Uh, when we talk about this policy, I mean, I understand that cyber attacks are sort of difficult to get our hands around, uh, wrap our heads around. But, you know, when it comes to military prowess and, and a strong military, that's something that the U.S. has plenty of. So given the, the, the increase in recent hacks that we've seen from Lockheed Martin to the Sony networks to the, the Google hacks, why not? We have a big military. Why not threaten the, uh, any potential wrongdoers with retaliation on the ground? Well, I, I think that there's some truth in that, in that the feeling in the Pentagon and in the government is that we have to have some sort of policy on paper, given all the excitement and hoopla right now about cyber war and cyber attacks. And I will say that I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the policy as outlined yet. I'm just worried about what it could be. The Pentagon hasn't announced its, a policy, its policy officially yet. They certainly haven't said anything about WMD. Uh, which you said in the lead-in. They've just said, under some circumstances, we might respond to cyber attacks with military force. And to me, the trouble with that is just that the vast, vast majority of cyber attacks have nothing to do with the military, that criminal attacks, people trying to steal information and whatnot. Uh, and we need to be careful that we don't group that in with uh, the real high-end cyber attacks, which luckily we've never seen in the United States and which remain largely hypothetical. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we're not talking about writing a nice little screenplay for a Hollywood movie here. Uh, you know, Pentagon policy, even if just on paper, can have potential severe consequences both for this country and other countries across the globe. So uh, if this is just supposed to be some sort of a deterrent uh, effort, I mean, that just doesn't really make sense to me. It, it costs so much money to potentially get involved militarily. Why would you put a, a open-ended conflict as a deterrent um, when it seems like there's other policies you can put in place instead? Well, I tend to agree that it's sort of a bad idea in advance to tie or try to tie the hands of future presidents and congresses in terms of what response we have to cyber attacks. It seems to me that we risk sort of saying uh, in an overly specific way what we're going to do. I think that other countries understand now that if they do something, whether it's cyber or not, that kills Americans, they're going to be subject to retaliation. But do so they? It, I mean, we say that, you know, harboring terrorists is bad, and yet there's plenty of allies that we have, uh, Pakistan case in point, that potentially harbor certain people that we're not necessarily unfriendly relations with and don't see consequences. So uh, I don't know if the threat of something is necessarily that powerful. Well, I, I think that deterrence tends to work, and there are certainly cases where countries choose because of their own internal politics to take that risk. But I do think countries understand uh, that, that uh, if you kill Americans uh, using uh, cyber or whatever it is, that you're, you're, gonna, you're taking a big risk in terms of retaliation. So what's the point the, of making it official? Because you're going to tie people's hands. So to me, this issue. is just a bureaucracy um, trying to deal with something that really we don't need to deal with right now. I think it would be better to just be silent uh, and not put something down on paper. And of course, the bigger issue is that uh, it's not con countries that more often than not that carry out cyber yeah. attacks. It's individual hackers. You know, if if a bunch of kids in a cyber cafe in China or in Moscow or you know in Israel do something, uh, how do you prove that it's the the hackers and not the country? I mean, it seems like you're sort of going down a slippery slope there. How do you prove intent and who's really behind that? And is the Pentagon even capable of outlining that properly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've seen situations with uh, Russia and Estonia where Estonia is in NATO, uh, and there was allegations that the Russian government was involved in hacking a variety of Estonian websites, but we don't really know 
uh, what the relationship between the government and the hackers was. So does the United States want to say uh, we're going to deter, deter Russia with nuclear weapons because of some hackers in the Moscow Internet Cafe? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think that that's really, uh, that seems like an overly bellicose threat to me. Uh, so I think we need to be careful uh, that we don't uh, tie our hands uh, in advance. I think we can sort of uh, let, it, let it develop uh, with events. And at the same time, with the, uh, the launch of the Cyber Command, um, you know, our, our own cyber warfare, I guess, resources are, are getting more and more developed. We have this sort of cottage industry that has sprung around the, the threat of cyber warfare and cyber attacks. Um, and, and there have been some experts that have alleged that, for example, the Stuxnet virus that attacked, uh, that, that, that crippled uh, the Iranian reactors was somehow potentially developed maybe in collaboration with the U.S. government. Whether that's true or not, it does raise the question of if the United States is one of the more developed countries that's capable of, of launching offensive cyber operations. I don't know, isn't there a, the issue of hypocrisy here? Well, uh, it's only hypocrisy if you don't get away with it. So uh, I think the United States, uh, being the most powerful country in the world, uh, can get away with a lot of stuff. Uh, I think that we ought to have offensive cyber capabilities. I think it would be a mistake not to explore that uh, technology. But I think there is some truth in the fact that if you uh, have this capability, uh, you risk uh, looking hypocritical uh, if you make bellicose threats in response to other people exercising the same capability. Espionage is, is typically defined as a kind of cyber attack. Uh, and do we really want to get into a war over espionage? States spy on each other all the time. Uh, we don't go to war over There was obviously lots of spying in the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, short of war. So again, uh, I think we need to be careful uh, about locking ourselves in. And if we're going to say, let's respond with military means, let's be clear that it's only in response to lethal attacks that kill uh, a, a fair number of people, not hackers, not people stealing credit card info and things of that nature. And how many lethal attacks has the U.S. Uh, had in terms of cyber warfare in its well, will? Cyber warfare has never killed anybody in the mm -hmm. world, as far as we know. So I, this is what I mean. I think a lot of this is, is somewhat hysterical. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate Thanks. having you here in studio. That was Benjamin Friedman, Research Fellow at the Cato Institute.